nine months in the world this year. I mean, if you think about it, the, the Penster, I mean, they, they haven't even already been in business more than two years. So the social landscape is very fractured. I mean, by fractured, it's just so much because people just go where they like. I think that's why Google Plus is trying to put people in those certain circles, right? Um, we've seen them change a lot of stuff around. We've seen Facebook change a lot of stuff around. So it's going to be really interesting. So we'll talk about social today. But what does mobile mean to you? What does that mean to you in your store? Anywhere, anytime. So do you look at mobile? Do you have a mobile strategy in your store? Um, we've attempted. Yeah, it's, it's kind of difficult, isn't it? You know, when we think of mobile, do you think of apps? Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk about that. It's kind of interesting to see how the consumer behaviors, how, how they, you know, there's this perception out there in the industry that consumers actually use all these apps. So in essence, they don't. It's kind of interesting for certain things, like downloading to buy a car versus just going to a mobile website. Big difference there. Oh, one of your peers at the Cavender Auto Group in San Antonio, Roland Perez, I'll just give you an example. They spent thousands of dollars building apps for all 27 stores and if they get 200 people a month to download the app that would be a lot because yeah. most people are going to mobile sites so we'll talk about mobile strategies and most importantly how you measure that and are you measuring are you measuring mobile now traffic to your website well yeah, good well at least you, at least you know yeah. what percentage of your traffic would you say is mobile Oh, I'm going to guess right now 25, because I didn't look at last month's report. Sorry. Um, 25, 30 percent. Was that, was that, where about 80? About 80. Wow. Wow. So there are strategies out there. Uh, uh, my good friends in Louisville, Kentucky, the Sam Swope Group, um, for the last six months, but every other month, so three times now, they've ran a complete TV campaign about their new mobile website, even though they've always had a mobile website. And their traffic went up almost 1,500 percent. Just the perception that the consumer thinks, "Oh, wow, I can go shop on this on my mobile device," even though they've always had a mobile site. Does that make sense? It's just it's just branding it to the customer. And then the last part is uh, is the local part uh, in the center, which is what does local mean to you? And this is probably where these two things kind of intertwine really well together. I mean, we all sell about 99 percent of the cars within a 30 mile radius of our location. Um, you know, we're judged by the manufacturers, the OEMs, based on sales effectiveness numbers, based on that demographic location. And the different differentiation today is so critical because I can go buy a Ford probably, how many Ford stores are there in Indianapolis? Oh, well, just close one. Four? Sure. Or how many Chevy stores? Four or five. Yeah, so you know, and whatever your brand is, unless you just have one Unless you're a Lexus dealer, there's no other Lexus dealers, but that doesn't mean anything today because they'll shop Cincinnati, Chicago. I mean, really, it's, it's all relative to dealers pay the same amount for every car. Why are you buying it from us? And that's kind of the gist of what we'll talk about today. Uh, those three things and make sure your strategies align with it. And then how we take this social piece and intertwine reputation management into it and why it's so important. Um, I think one of the biggest things we see in the industry today is the growth of how people are talking about us, and more importantly, how that affects uh, potential prospects, and how they make a decision, which really bugs to the, the, the local piece. Why am I buying it from you instead of him? You know, it, it's really money. And what's interesting, the Google study, they did their automotive study for digital dealer uh, earlier this year, and they found that the price was number four. So the other variables there was selection, obviously, um, availability of options to that selection, um, and then how you treat people. So rep management overtook literally what pricing was. Because you can basically probably get pretty close to the same price in the same car three or four different places. It's really kind of interesting to see in that study. So with that being said, and we'll follow along. I'm Jack Simmons, by the way, with cars.com. You don't need to see my other You guys are already seeing me. So 35 years in the car business. I started as a lot boy when I was 17. And uh, I've done everything in the business you could possibly do. I was a big Pontiac dealer for 12 years in Plant City, Florida. Uh, we sold the property, uh, not the store, but the property that to uh, Walmart. And then I went to work for Mannheim Auctions Corporate in Atlanta for five years. And probably one of my favorite parts of my story or my history was that uh, they sent me over to a meeting at Cox Enterprises. 
1998, about 30 people in there, a lot of techie people, not a lot of sales tech people like buy it. And uh, the name of that company was called AutoConnect. That was the original genesis of AutoTrader.com. So I spent uh, quite a few years with our peers over at AutoTrader um, before coming to car. So. so with that being said, we'll follow along here. We'll talk about the social, local, global. We, did, we already talked about what that means to you. I mean, I think we all understand that the world's changed, especially how consumers interact with technology tools. Um, if you just look back in 2008, uh, what was launched then, it's kind of interesting. A lot of people don't realize that the iPad was developed before the iPhone. And if you read Steve Jobs' autobiography, you would have found that to be true because they didn't come out at the same time. So a lot of transitions from social environments. Uh, both Apple and Android obviously own, I mean, every month it's give or take in the United States on market share. But no different from MySpace to Facebook, as is RIM, which is BlackBerry is today, it used to have almost 80% of the, of the enterprise business in the United States today, it's less than 12. So things change pretty rapidly. Uh, wouldn't be a big block for today. That's just my opinion. That's why I have the iPhone. And then this started social media, literally, in uh, 2009. Uh, the national the check-in, obviously the tablet business, we'll talk about that. In the Nielsen study that we commissioned on mobile behavior, it's kind of interesting to watch how these consumers interact with these devices when it comes to shopping for cars. And obviously Facebook, Yelp, any Yelpers in here? Anybody yell? You yell? I travel, so I yell a lot. Uh, I'm not a mayor of any place because I never stay in one place very long. But uh, but I do use it when I land, I go to a hotel, I'll check in, and then instantly I'll get uh, 10 to 20% coupons off. It's a local eatery, so guess where I'm going to go eat? So uh, that's the reason why the landscape's so fractured. There's so many places that we have to measure and monitor today. It's kind of overwhelming, actually. You know, how do we do it? How do we get started? And then how do we manage it? Who do we hire to manage it? Do we hire somebody? Do we do it in-house? All these different things. So we'll talk about building your social reputation, differentiating your brand, and then uh, connecting across mobile platforms. So in the social space, a couple of things that came up yesterday in the panel. Was anybody in the panel, saw the panel yesterday? It was myself and Ralph and uh, Peter from Google and Social Dealer. Kind of interesting. So one of the biggest things we talk about is, you know, if you don't have the good blocking and tackling down already, trying to get into this space and jumping over that without good processes, your store really doesn't matter. You know, and what we are seeing today is that we can't directly say that we sold two or three cars from Facebook or two or three cars from Twitter. We do know it has a huge impact on consumer decisions and how they interact with you, especially how they interact with other people that have interacted with you. So a couple things you want to think about is, you know, you got to set realistic goals here. Um, there's all kinds of uh, good companies out there selling packages to manage it for you. Uh, you may hire somebody in-house to manage it for you. There's, there's no really golden egg there. But the thing is, you've got to be realistic. One of the most important things that I see when I talk to dealers all the time, and, and this has been a big topic in my uh, doing NADA 20 groups, is, you know, I'll say, how many people do you have like you on Facebook right now? Which you say? And it's just a guess. It doesn't have to be exact. Like me? No, how many, how many uh, fans do you have on Facebook? Personally. No, dealership. Dealership. Oh. Well, okay. you can tell me personally, too. Well, one, one store has 180, okay. um, one 296, which is a PR brand. Shocking by age demographic. Think about that, though. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And 60 and 98. Okay. How about for you? Uh, for one of my kids, about 400. Okay. Yeah, CJD, Honda, probably get close to 300. Okay, good. Well, number's growing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I see that was about two Okay. And you? That's it. It's a couple hundred a store? Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this question. How how much of your employee base at each of those stores are fans on your Facebook page? Less than 10%. Yeah. So there's this idea that we're always, we're always trying to drive a culture within our consumer base to interact with us when actually what we found is and, and we found this kind of accident, the dealers are actually making sure that every employee is part of that group, likes all your, especially your Facebook page. And then once a month, you go out and seek out employees that do things in the community. Now, you don't allow employees to post to your, to your thing, because somebody needs to manage that. You know, obviously you want to make sure that, you know, that there's no fraud and the wrong things don't get up there. 
But here's the thing, you have people, whether it's a mechanic, a guy, or a gal, a body shop, a service advisor that works with kids, that works with battered women, that works with the church, that volunteers, that does Little League Baseball, and we never take that, which is really the, the big piece of social, and then the most important piece of local, and start inputting that content in, which drives our consumer base to start communicating with us. Because now what you've done is open up a conversation that is relevant to a potential consumer of yours, but now it has to do with you. Do you follow along with what I'm saying? Content is king here. You know, to, to hope that all your 200 customers are gonna say something nice about you every month and keep your content up is not realistic. So what we found is a very good way to start generating content because what happens is all of their friends start doing what? If I'm a little league coach and I talked about the game and I got 10 kids or 12 kids on my team, then every parent's now doing that and then every one of their parents and grandparents and this is all about local combined with social. So it's really, you gotta be realistic. But I can tell you if, you, if you devise a strategy in your store that revolves around your employees generating your content, you're gonna be amazed at how you go. Well, the stores will, the Honda store will almost triple the amount in less than a month. And then just the first month they started asking their employees, what do you do in the community? What do you do for hobbies? And then they started having these conversations which you had a whole new group of people having this, this conversation around your business. You know, so it's, it's you know, like the circles in Google Plus, you, you're now going to be able to really start segmenting how people communicate with you. So, you know, you got to participate in the conversations. It's just one little piece I wanted to give you on that. So, which brings us into the reputation management. So, inside your workbook, and, and you guys can put in whatever you like, but if you had 100 of your best customers go online, and this is on page four, See that left page on page four? And wrote a review about you and their experience, what would that be worth to you? A hundred of them, what would it be worth? What kind of dollar amount would you put on that? And that there's no wrong answer here. Okay, but one month of your advertising budget would be what to you? These stores about five thousand. So 5,000, so if you divided that by 100, that would be what? 50 bucks? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you think that's high, low? Oh, I think it's low. You do? Yeah. Well, what would high, what would you think, 100? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about you? Uh, yeah, so is it fair to say, would you agree that, that that one review could be worth thousands of dollars to you, to potential customers? Sure. Mm -hmm. So we all agree on that. And one of my favorite lines that I hear when I train about reputation management is, anybody fill in the blank? It's the tagline to MasterCard. It starts with a P. Good yeah. job. Yeah. All right, I'll give you a gift, but I don't have it. Okay, so, good job though. But it is really priceless, and I say this everywhere, and I said this two years ago, before, you know, we've been in the CSI business internally. We've never had an external piece of that till now because of social space. People talk, they talk all the time because they can, because they have a smart device and we live with these things. So it's kind of interesting to see how much people are communicating about every experience they have in all kinds of different environments. And I always say this, I said, if you could have a marketing tool that you all say in some values, some shape or form, right? and it is worth that much to you, and if you do it correctly, it's priceless and it's absolutely free. That's the key. So you gotta build volume around it. Now, one of the interesting things, so I'm just gonna put it in context for you a little bit, but we've been in the business now, now we were in Cars.com, which newcomers to this, so we've been doing this since June. So we have about 100,000 reviews on our site. So just to let you, the numbers. So you know that old uh, psychology, the 80-20 rule, 80% is pretty good, 20% is maybe not so perfect. And our CSI score is kind of, you know, you can be 90-10. We, we, we take good care of people, we do. Our CSI scores tell us that. But you know, it's interesting that on our site, still about 85% of our reviews are 4.4 out of a five-star system or higher. So that means we are doing a good job. And here's the big piece that we're not doing. 
is only 17% of reviews are being responded to. So that means we're concentrating on which ones? The not so perfect ones, correct? Or the negative reviews. And what most people see is that's what we do as human beings. We're going to go read a bad review. That's where our eyes take us. So, but also to a potential customer that you're, you should respond to every review. You've got to respond to the good ones as well as the ones that aren't so good. Because what it does is it lets a future prospect know that you do care about your reputation, right? And the most important thing is maybe that person will come and write one too after their experience. And you'd say if they're worth a hundred bucks a piece just by responding, which costs nothing but time. Um, and then just to put this into, when we, when we first started, we, we partnered with Bizarre Voice. Um, you've probably never heard of this company. They're the, the worldwide industry leader in online reputation management, not automotive. They do Apple, they do Costco, they do Macy's. I mean, the list is huge. And some of the Kelton studies that we had done before we got in the review business, and this is really interesting, said 90, it's, the percentage is 91, but 90 plus percent of consumers were looking at service reviews prior to purchase. Service reviews. So this idea that it takes three or four hours to buy physically in the store is not nearly important to a consumer as the four or five years to own it and have it serviced. Isn't that interesting? So, what does that mean? So on our site, we have less than 20% of reviews are on service. And we'll talk about how we can generate more reviews. Um, and we eliminate, you know, when we first started, we had IP address filters that it wouldn't allow you to take an iPad down into service and ask four or five a day. And most companies don't let you do that. We, we changed that. We open it up now so you can do as many as you want. We do watch it to make sure, you know, because we do scrub the email addresses, they gotta be real. I will tell you about 10% of our reviews never get filtered out, never make it to the web. For, uh, and we, and Bizarre Voice uses algorithms, Google uses Bizarre Voice too, by the way, um, to filter out word, certain word, like cuss words and stuff like that. It just automatically filters them out by, by word recognition. It's kind of cool how the back end tool works. So, you know, even though you're going to get people to write them, some of them you're just never going to make it through just because of the experience or how they wrote it. We also require a minimum amount of characters. So you can't go put it in there like, great job, or love them. You have to write a minimum of 140 characters in there. So you have to write something, which is good to the consumer experience, because consumers want to see you know, an honest, real review. So that's why it's so critical today. And we're going to go through a process, and I'll have you write it down in your workbook, about who does that and who monitors it. All right, this, this, since it's football Friday, there may be some people wearing a sack over their head. See, Notre Dame plays Purdue today. It's a big game. Yeah. Um, who do you like that game? Notre Dame. Or your Purdue. Mm -hmm. I went to Indiana. Of course, we don't play football there. We just started playing basketball there. So, just to give you some insights here when we're talking about the social space and where people are writing reviews, how many of you use either uh, get, who's getlisted.org? Anybody use this? Um, this is a really free, it's a free site. You can write it down. There's a couple sites out there, but what it's going to do is give you listing scores. And basically what it's going to say is how, what percentage of all this social environment do you own your pages for? So it's, it's not difficult. You know, just owning it is the key, because if you think that you can manage 30 or 40 different social media sites all the time, you're, you can't. No, it's not going to happen. But what this will let you do, it'll give you a listing score to tell you how to make sure all your pages are claimed. What's worse is you wouldn't want your competitors to claim your pages. I want you to think about that. That can happen. They're going to verify with you just like when you do Google+. Plus. Local, you know, that it's you, that your phone number's correct, the email's correct. Be careful on those emails, too, especially if somebody changes. And then claim all your others. And, and most of these, uh, I guess, you know, Angie's, how many are, do you have claim environments on Angie's list? You definitely should. I mean, you see her, I mean, their nationwide marketing is huge. Um, I don't know if you like golf or not, but, um, you know, there's another company called Reputation.com. Launched, I don't know if you've seen those in sports. They're really good, a big national campaign. Um, so there are all kinds of different places. This is yesterday's old Better Business Bureau, except online. But go in to get listed and claim your pages because that's going to help you. Uh, just to give you an example of how easy this is. 
So what's interesting is about us at CARS, the same week that Google changed Google Places to Google Plus Local, we changed our dealer pro profile pages. And this is brand differentiation in a new car. Uh, how many of you got in and, and uh, redone your pages on Google? Yeah, good for you. And if you haven't, make sure you put video in there. Make sure you load up your pictures. Um, this environment here, especially just on our site, so I think, does everybody use cars.com in here? Yes? Yeah. Have you done your dealer profile page here? It's almost just like a Google Plus page. Make sure you get your videos in there. Uh, this helps for search too, by the way. Uh, this is what this is what differentiates you from your other competitors in the marketplace. So you want to make sure that you're doing the right things. You got to check all the information. I know these are simple. Make sure your map's right. That's really critical. Have you ever got in and found it or wasn't right? You got to make sure you're using a featured review. So just to give you a little background. So just got to make sure all these things. So anytime you claim a page, whether it's on us, whether it's on Yelp, whether wherever it is. You want to make sure that all this information is correct.